Um, when oh, let me hit record. Okay, whenever you're ready, take one go. Hi, this is Jacob Bustos from portionyourplate.com, and you are listening to Jeff Smith on Vroom Vroom Veer podcast. All right, can we do a take two where you kind of like fumble over your words and screw up a little bit? You want me to? You want me to screw up on purpose? No, I'm just teasing. You don't really have oh. to do that. <laughs> I wanted to I'm give like, us an opportunity to laugh about that. <laughs> I'm like, hold on a second. You really want me to screw it up? Because I can try my best. <laughs> Not if you don't do uh, it naturally and you nailed it. So, okay. Oh, well, uh, well, we could we could do it one more time just in case you like the second one better. If you want to. Okay, ready? Yes, I'm ready. Hi, this is Jacob Bustos from PortionYourPlate.com. And you are listening to Jeff Smith on Room Room Veer podcast. I don't know. They're pretty much the same. What do you think? I know. <laughs> You're just good at that. <laughs> yeah, you know, if somebody asks you to do a promo, you just drop it. You know, most people get nervous and screw up. So I, I've done I've done TV a couple of times, and it's you, you kind of uh, get used to it after a while. Gotcha. You've got that sort of like mic confidence thing. <laughs> well, I try. <laughs> and a great sometimes, laugh, by the way. Thanks. Sometimes I suck at it, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Okay, I'm gonna hit stop. I'll be right back, and we'll do the show. Okay, sounds good. All right, hold on. Are you ready to thoughtfully steer away from your revved up, frenzied, and far too often scripted life? Then welcome to Vroom Vroom Veer with Jeff Smith, where he guides you down the road differently traveled by sharing unique experiences with guests who have managed to shift away from a life stuck on cruise control and veered their way into a more authentic and fulfilling one in all sorts of interesting and kind of remarkable ways. Get ready to Vroom Vroom Veer with your differently traveled road chauffeur, Jeff Smith. Thank you so much for being on Vroom Vroom Beer and welcome to the show. How's it going? It is going so well. Uh, I am talking to you from the future because I'm in Australia and I'm one day ahead. So if you, you want the lotto ahead. numbers, now is the time to ask. You're right. welcome. <laughs> Let's do that off the off the recording, okay? Because I don't okay. want to share my my winnings with everybody. Oh, well, that's right? the deal. 50-50. You think yes. I'm giving this team a free? No, <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay. Guess again, Jess Smith. So Guess again, buddy. We, we have a date after we hang up. You give me the lotto numbers and we'll share that billion dollars. Perfect. Okay. So you have way too much energy for seven o'clock in the morning in Australia. So way to go on that. Um, so talk a little bit about what you're most excited about over at the talentsquad.com. Oh, well, we've got a few new clients this week, so I always get super excited about the Congrats. onboard process. Yeah. But then I end up like, because I read their book and I go down the rabbit hole. Yes. So You're doing your homework. We, yes. Yeah, yeah. Because we have um, such a array of, you know, expertise. Yeah. I'm always, I'm always learning something. So I get excited because one, I've got a new client. Excellent. Two, they're about to get booked on podcast. Great. Three, I get to read their book, learn all the things. So it's been, yeah, it's been a lot of learning this week. So that's nice. what I'm excited about. <laughs> that, you know, I, that's probably one of my favorite things about being a podcaster, podcast host, whatever the hell I am, is that I get to meet amazing people that I otherwise would never, ever talk to. That's amazing. Yes. Right? Agreed. That's amazing. Always learning. <laughs> yes. Always learning. Always learning. Always having that new perspective. Always having everything that I thought I knew turned upside down every week. It's amazing. So yeah, I'm I'm right there with you. So congratulations. So this is Vroom Vroom Veer. I don't know if you know what you got yourself into, but we go back in time and talk about Kelly before she became a media mogul. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if you know what you got yourself into i don't Let's flip that around uh, yeah. you're about to go on a ride strap yourself in we're riding on the other side of the road oh yeah oh yeah so where did you grow up did you grow up in australia somewhere yes i grew up in a place called valentine which is in newcastle australia so that's about two hours north of sydney okay and spoiler alert i'm about one kilometer away from there right now i'm at my parents house beautiful so okay i fly i'm a bird i fly south for the winter smart i leave the states and come back to australia for the aussie summer so nice. i'm in my home area right now beautiful wow so that's that's nice so basically you never experience any sort of winter Nope, that's a hard pass from me. <laughs> I'm right there with you. 
I don't want yeah. I don't want anything to do with winter. I grew up in Michigan. So, you know, really close to the Wisconsin border, hence the Green Bay Packers. But yeah, uh frozen tundra, I don't need that anymore. I, I had it no. all the way up till eighteen years old and, and now I, I had enough. Once I figured out cold hurts and I could not understand what was happening, I'm like, why 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 is the world biting my feet even though I'm inside shoes? It's biting me, it's hurting me. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I went back to the apartment in New York and I booked that flight and I went back to Australia and said, I'll see you next year, New yeah. York. <laughs> when you're when you're when you're when you've got yourself together and you're a little bit more ready for, for me. Yes. Or or when I'm really more when I'm not being a baby and I'm ready for you because I can't handle it and I'm gonna end up in the Darwin Awards front cover for <laughs> Something bad happening because I don't know what to do in wintertime. Freezing that's, to death on the streets of New York. <laughs> yeah. Yikes. I'm looking up, can your blood freeze? How Because I don't know how winter, we, I mean, there's many Australians who have never seen snow, right? Right. So, right. Um, we just don't, I, I'll wrestle a crocodile, I'll poke a shark in the eye, I'm fine. Spiders, no problem, I'm okay. Scorpions, no problem. Yeah, put me, put me outside in snow, I don't know what to do. I can, Forget it. <laughs> I suddenly I can't walk at the walk suddenly and I don't know what's hurts. happening. What's happening? Yeah. What is yeah, this? Why is not air. <laughs> yeah, well, air why why is the air hurting me? <laughs> uh yeah, I remember. Uh anyway. So, okay, so you grew up uh, basically uh in a suburb, I guess you'd call it, of Sydney? Yeah. Okay. Oh, no, it's two hours north of Sydney. It's a place so, called okay. Newcastle. But, Newcastle, um, right. yeah, it's it's a suburban upbringing, that's for sure. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So what sort of, uh, what sort of like, upbringing did you have? So what were you like in high school? Were you like a nerd? Were you like an athlete? Were you like, uh, I don't know, an ambassador like me, a drama nerd? I don't know. What were you? Yeah, so it's <laughs> different in Australia than okay. all the U.S. TV shows. Okay. So I went to a high school and we only had 64 people in my class. 64 so, people in the whole class. Yeah. So wow. we, um, so and everybody we always, knows each other, you know, well, not only in your class in, well, we call it your year, right? So right. you're seven, year eight, our high schools go from year seven to year 12. Right. And, um, so not only do you know your, your year, you pretty much know the entire school. Wow. And if, especially if they're siblings, which they're, they're always a family, siblings, multiple kids, um, you often know the whole family, the whole school. Right. So, um, we, yeah, so it wasn't really, we, yeah, it's just not the same way. It's just not the same way as in the US. And when I went to high school, this is a long time ago now, I graduated in 96. In okay. year seven and eight, it was separated ma male and female. Interesting. So, okay. Yeah. And we all wear school uniforms. So it's a completely different. And that's, like a, that's a public school, not a private school? Um, I went to a private school. However, okay. every every school for high school, at least for um, primary school, no. But every student in Australia wears school uniforms regardless of. Really? Of public, every single school. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So it's, um, it's, I think it's, I quite, well, I grew up with it and you complain about it your whole life and all you'd see is American kids on TV and be like, they get to wear what they want. How awesome. Right. Um, but now that I'm older and looking back with perspective, I'm like, it's great. You don't have to worry about what you're wearing. Everyone's yeah. on the same playing field. You've all got right. the same uniform. Right. Um, so Were I really Were you able to accessorize it. at all or not? Nope. Mm -mm. None. Wow. So uh, there's all rules because then there's no one standing out and you're no, all I get on the it. same playing field. I get field. the idea. So, yeah. I, yeah. I kind of like the idea. It's like, a, it's a lot like being in the military, right? You can't really dress up <laughs> in the military. Yeah. Right. Everybody's so, wearing like, the same clothes. We're all the same. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You couldn't dye your hair for girls. You couldn't dye your hair. Your skirt had to be a certain length. Like you couldn't make it like super short. It had to be below, below the knee. We all had to have the same school shoes. Um, the guys had to wear ties and long pants for even in summer and yeah so and if you went outside the school you had to wear your blazer and your hat um yeah so there's all these but you, yeah there were all these rules of the school uniform which yeah. seems quite strange now yeah, yeah. like you could you could wear you could wear a jumper which is a sweater yeah but you could wear a sweater only inside the school grounds but once you went, went outside you could wear a blazer but you could wear a blazer over the top of your sweater like the fact that I even remember all these and learning these is pretty amazing <laughs> But, right, um, right. but yeah, it takes away the, you've got this expensive clothes or you've got that brand and I don't, because it doesn't matter where you come from. Every kid is ending up the same. And then it is a sense of, 
of community. So I think that it is. But I grew up. You might, Jeff. What's your opinion? You, I mean, you grew up outside it. Do you think that it's absolutely ridiculous? What do no, you think? no, no, no. I, you know, being a Gemini, I know that's that's a dumb thing to say, but <laughs> I always see. Yeah, like I the am pro- looking. F- yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing where the Gemini com- uh, yeah. comment fits in with the school uniform, but let's roll right. with it. Okay. Yeah. I mean, go you f- could go ask my, whenever you uh, whenever you ask my opinion, I'm going to say there's pros and cons to both things, right? So I, I like can it. I can definitely you know I I'm, that's what I see as a Gemini. He's always confused because he's in the middle. He's a fence sitter. He doesn't take a position. All right, that's the Gemini that I am anyway. <laughs> Yeah, you've got two faces and, you know, that's it's everything's got a good side and a bad side. So, you know, yeah, all those good things that you said about it, you know, uh, I agree with, you know, on the other side, I can also see like it might feel confining and it might feel regimented and strict, you know. Mm. Um, So, you know, I don't know. Who knows? I mean, I'm thoroughly Uh, and totally psychologically screwed up. So. (laughs) So I guess Who it really isn't? it really doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> In the end, we all come out screwed up. <laughs> yeah. How, and, and whether we, there's uniforms or not, you know. And schools have things called Mufti Day, usually once a semester, once a term, whatever it is. And uh-huh. that's where you can wear whatever you want to school. Okay. So, See, now, you know, and I also, I had like, I had a, a, an interesting sort of, uh, whole like school experience because for a long the, a long time I would say like maybe through middle school so that would be like sixth seventh eighth grade I would have said I was kind of like a misfit outsider kind of vibe to my personality growing up right where I kind of just stuck to my group of friends and you know a, a small group of friends right and I you know was just kind of like hiding out from everybody else, not trying to be anybody other than anybody popular or smart or anything like that. But then later on, like in high school, um, it changed for me because I, I became a little bit more like, I never was like the cool kid, like the, you know, what popular kid, like, I don't know what that would be like in Australia, but like a football player and a cheerleader, right? Those are the cool kids, right? (laughs) I was never that, but I did hang around with a lot of different people in high school and a lot of different groups of people in high school. So um, I, I got over that misfitty thing. I don't know. What was that like for you? Did you feel like you fit, fit in? Um, you know, I was you just talking about that just reminded me of something. There actually were groups in school, but right. they were even sort of set out by the school, right? Because you had to do um, extracurricular activities. Right. So would have to do and, and there were a few choices and you had to pick one right so I was in the okay. school orchestra I even forgot about this I was in the school orchestra and I played the flute so that was nice. my thing and they would have the STU which is student I don't even know what that stands for SATU student adventure unit so they would be wow, it would be that like sounds fun <laughs> it would be like the military equivalent like oh. outdoors and you're there for a couple of days and like survival type army things okay um and then you'd have um there was the choir there was the Mm. yeah all these different things so you had to pick one so you kind of had to fit in a box and do a co-curricular but only what the options that they gave you right okay um so there was that and then you had to pick sports so you'd be picking a sport and I was never sporty oh everybody had to pick a sport Oh, yeah. So we had sports days. Sports required? Wow. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. I was speaking to someone about this the other day. Oh, everybody. And then so we have a swimming carnival once a year. Swimming carnival. Okay. That's awesome. So I never heard those two words go together. That's awesome. So, yeah. (laughs) So you take the whole day off school. The whole school goes there and you have to go in races. So you everybody has to go in like three races. So... But, and, and I was fat, so that was not pleasant for me. And you're wearing the school swimmers. Like, it's horrible. And then you have the athletics day. So you have to go in, you know, X amount of track events, X amount of field events. Wow. So you had the swimming carnival. That, and then you'd have sports. So you'd have you'd have a choice of three. It would be netball, softball. and I don't even know what netball is. Is that volleyball? It's, it's like basketball, but you don't oh. get to bounce it. Um, wow. softball and something else that was a winter sport. And then for summer sport, you would have to pick them. So they were very good about 
forcing what, you like, into like you're going to do something pick yeah it's like sport <laughs> you, you're you're australian you're doing it and this is yeah. and you have to do it and that's, like even your awesome. parents sending a note saying i'm not participating i'm not going to the sports day like you got a detention for that so wow. once i didn't go to it and then i ended up with a detention nice and then like somebody wow. threw a, br- a brain in a glove on a bus and somebody called in and we got saturday detentions which is going to the or a half Saturday, uh, which is going that's to like school. Breakfast club, yeah, yeah, it absolutely is going to school <laughs> in your school uniform on in your a school Saturday uniform morning. on a Saturday. Uh, so not only is it breakfast club and they got left alone, but you have to go to school and wear your uniform, which is like, why is that kid doing? And then make make they probably made you do something really like boring and. Hard. Oh yeah, we just had to sit in the room. The teacher didn't want to be there any more oh, than we wanted to be there. You just had to sit there basically yeah. and meditate on what um, what you did wrong. Yeah, That's and we have, at the school we had afternoon detentions, which they made on a Friday to make it worse. Ugh. So, like, you Ugh. would have to stay back after school on a Friday afternoon. Uh, that's an awful. That's yeah. The worst. So anyway, sorry. Is this what you wanted to know? Yes. Just now I'm yes. just reliving my no, uh, no, school no, days no, because I have comments. You know, it's, yeah. It's I just, think it's I think just a different. lot about. I like a lot about um, your, the differences, right? So I don't know mm. if you know this, but like. There's no, when I grew up, now I, this might vary from state to school and whatever, but for me, um, there, was n- there was no required athletic participation. None mm. of, that was never required. There was a required class, they called it gym or physical education or something, where like one hour a day, I guess, um, you had to g- go and put like workout clothes on and run around and be athletic-y for an hour and get sweaty it was just like for exercise but there it was sometimes organized and sometimes not right so sometimes you would just run around in the gym and act foolish um in your in your gym clothes um or sometimes they would organize games and but whatever it was just basically the the physical education teacher killing an hour with sporty stuff right but we didn't we ne- i never had any if you wanted to do a thing you had to you had to do it on your own time and uh, and you had to volunteer and you had to pay for that all. It wasn't like a required school thing. So oh, that's a big so difference. Did, yeah. Yeah. You didn't have to get on the mini bus, drive down to the local ocean bars and swim laps. No, no. We did. Well, I and mean, it was all- <laughs> people did those things, but they they were volunteer. You had to try who would, out. Who for would the volunteer team. for that? Ain't uh, nobody people volunteering that wanted for to that. Swim. <laughs> Crazy. I know, right? Crazy. I would never volunteer as tribute. Never. <laughs> See, I'd rather go. be in the Hunger Games. I would rather be in the Hunger Games than do laps of the ocean right. baths, stinging my eyes. Yeah. Stinging that, my eyes. That's rough. But uh, I can see that it would be uh, it would be interesting, though. I mean, at least maybe you might find something that you like in 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 athletics, even if you hate all three choices. <laughs> I don't oh, know. I hate it. No, it, but no. I think it builds character. So, right. you know, right. am I am I here today? Yeah. Did I live through it? Yeah. yeah. Did everyone live through it? Yes, they did. Right. That's true. That's I, it. It's I just think, part yeah. of like you're, because you're gonna yeah. when you get out into the working world, that kind of stuff is gonna happen to you, where you have to do things you don't want to do. Exactly. In order to keep making money, basically. <laughs> I suppose you can always quit. You know, but. Essentially, you have to do the thing if you want to keep your job, right? So that's a good lesson to learn early. Like you don't always get what you want. You have to do things you don't want to do. That's a good lesson, I think, right? Yeah. Now I know like 20 sports. <laughs> that you never wanted to know. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh huh. So maybe not perfect, but also, you know, I can see the willy nilliness of the, the, the U.S. system that I grew up in was not great either, you know? Because it was a hard lesson for me to learn when I got to the working world that, you know, there's I have to do things I don't want to do. Uh, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, I fair enough. <laughs> right. I didn't, uh, that, that, so it was a rude awakening. How's that sound? Yeah. Well, and when I, I was in the military, school. So. Wow. When I was in school, they still had the cane. Oh, my God. Yikes. But only for boys. Only for boys. Huh. Wow. That's right. So that yeah, it's a very different. I'm sure it's thoroughly you know what? different. I, I wonder if they have it now. I don't even know. I am assuming no. Um, 
<laughs> right. But it wasn't, I mean, that was still in 1996. Yeah. I guess that's a long time ago, but still even then it was a bit outdated. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, it's different, but you only know what you know at the time. You have no comparison when you're that age unless right. you're watching TV. Right. And even that seems like not the real world. So it's only looking back that you think, yeah, when I say that out loud, that seems crazy. Right. Well, you know, it, it is what it is. Humans are wild and free, you know. They, there's no like scientific method going on here, you know. <laughs> We're just banging rocks together and trying to get through it all. Anyway, so did you uh, did you end up going to college after high school? I went to, I did, but I dropped out. So I went to another state and I did a. Um, what was it? Hos- business hospitality degree. Couldn't okay. handle it. Right. It was a university. Gosh, it was at Albury Wodonga. So I packed up my little Toyota Corolla, um, drove down there, cried the whole way. Like my gut feeling was telling me it was wrong and I didn't want to do it, but I didn't know if I was just scared. Right. Um, so drove down there, lasted, I think about a month, came back um, and thought I'm a failure. I'm never going to do this. I can't even move out of home. Um, started doing a hospitality, um, just at the, at the, my mom was a teacher at the TAFE. So she's like, well, you're not sitting around doing nothing. Right. <laughs> We're going to put you in a hospitality, um, program or whatever, just to kill time. And then I applied to the local university and got in there. That's the university of Newcastle, just in a, a general arts degree. Okay. Um, but I wanted to do communications. So yeah, it took me a little while to get on track. To um, out. and then. And then I, um, cause I think I did what I thought I should do, not what I wanted to do. I think, yeah. So then most of our, then I, like, that's what I did too. I was like, I don't know yeah. what to do. Let's and try this. I, <laughs> I, yeah. And I applied for communications degree. Okay. Um, and then I transferred over from that. And then that was the track that I wanted to be on. Cause I always, I knew I always wanted to do something in media and entertainment. Wow. Just having grown up with US TV. Okay. Um, but, and so I ended up getting on that and, but I always had an itching to travel back to the States. So I, um, in 19, so I left, I finished in 1996 in high school. All this beeswax was happening in 1997. And then <laughs> <Beeswax>. in 19, <laughs> beeswax. <laughs> I love and it. then in 1990, like, so it's essentially I applied for college, got into college, dropped out of college, did a little bridging course, then got into university, then switched over to the communications degree. Right. And then I'm like, I want to go to US summer camp. I'm going to do that. So I went to Michigan. Really? In, yeah, wow. in Orton, Ortonville, Michigan. Wow. It was called Tamarack Camps. And I applied and got accepted in to be a ceramics teacher. And I didn't even know how to do ceramics. <laughs> so I was like, let me learn how to do I better this. learn how to do that real quick so I can teach and people I how to do it. And I took some classes and wow. – and that's a, it was sort of, that was a lot happening in that time between sort of 18 and 20, I would say. Yeah. Wow. So you go to, how, how does that even happen? How do you get a job with, that you don't know how to do? Did you sort of like uh, fudge your resume a little bit or were they just, how did that work out? Um, <laughs> so back in the day, like Australians going to US summer camp is, or at least it was a big thing. I'm not even sure if it is anymore. Okay. Um, but they have programs and you go to this big fair and then you go around to all the booths and they interview you and decide if you're good. So I went to a Jewish summer camp in Michigan for teaching ceramics. First of all, don't know how to do ceramics. Second of all, not Jewish. But somehow <laughs> I got myself in there and I could not have been more excited. Yeah. So no, I didn't fudge it. I just said, yes, I've done it in arts and crafts. Like they give you, it's like, well, I'm not going to do sports. Right. I can't do HBR horseback riding. Right. I, right. Uh, so I was. Um, You're just trying to pick something that maybe you could figure out. Yeah, like yeah. I did art in school and sure. you were and kind anyway, of crafty. Yeah, like I thought, well, how, yes, I will figure that out. But I I said I'd had some experience. I didn't say like I'm a full-time ceramicist or whatever. Right. Um, but <laughs> lucky for me, thing, yeah, know. lucky they um I ended up getting switched to arts and crafts, oh, junior okay. junior arts and crafts and it was the best. Awesome. It was I do still have a scar on my third finger on the left of where a hot glue gun got me. Lovely. 
Um, but other than that, <laughs> best time ever. Still friends with the girl I shared a tent with. Loved wow. it. Wow. Loved it. Like one of the best times in my life. So ever. Michi- summer, summer in Michigan is pretty nice. Yeah, it was yeah. lots of mosquito bites. Yes. Absolutely hot. Yes. Um, but again, it was were amazing, you incomparable. In you were living in the mosquito's house, basically? Yeah, I lived in a tent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I lived in a tent with two other girls, one Dutch girl yeah. and um, one Israeli girl. Wow. And, Holy cow. And it was it was the best experience and and of the my, and one all of the, the best and all the kids were like uh, Jewish kids going yep. to their summer camp. Yeah, so the bunk that I was attached to um they were all eight. So wow. it was just great. It was just yeah. and I've got a little niece and I just hope she gets to have the same experience that I do because having I first of all I think it's fun for kids but second of yeah. all having never experienced that and having only pretty much seen the parent trap it was like living in a movie <laughs> and you were totally also, in an American movie yeah I, yeah I think that's what I've done with my whole life I'll be perfectly honest I'm like I've seen tv I want to live in tv I'm going to make my own tv <laughs> and I'm I am the character yes um you're the main and, character you're not some yeah. side. Yeah. Well, every, character. everyone's the main character in their own TV show, so it, make yes. it make it make the episodes worthwhile. Make them good. Um, yeah. And then I learn all the Jewish stuff, right? Because I'm not Jewish, so right. that was also an inadvertent cultural experience right. that was fantastic and unparalleled. So sounds what like a great a experience I did. Yeah. Okay. So that sounds like fun. So, all right. So, um, let's see now you're, you're basically in your early twenties. Yes. And did you ever finish any sort of college or did you just go right into working? No. So I came back to Australia right. and continued with my communications degree, okay. which at the time was a little bit of radio, a little bit of video, all the kinds of things. And then I wanted to go back to the US to summer camp because it was so much fun. So okay. I did a year in Australia and then I figured out and then I found out that you could do an exchange program at the university, which I didn't even know existed. So I decided to do an exchange program to a high university in Athens, Ohio. Wow. And the reason is because when I looked at the map, I went, okay, I want to go back to summer camp, but I can't miss a year because of the way that the seasons and university years happen. If I go there, yep, okay, well, I could probably get on a Greyhound bus and go from Detroit, Michigan to um, to Ohio. I can't remember where I went in in Cincinnati, Ohio, where okay. a friend was. And then I'll go to university. And based on the fact that I'd already moved away and failed, I thought, okay, well, if I can just last one semester, that will be the goal. But if I come home, as long as I can do one semester. So this is all before Facebook. There's no map. No one has a phone. I picked from like there were internet labs. No one had a computer of right. their own. Yeah, so this I was is doing like, all still this. like 98-ish, right? 99 Um, Well, yeah, I ended up, it was the year 2000 okay. is when I went. Right. So Barely I'm, an I'm, internet. Hardly an internet. Yeah. So I did all this from computer labs. No idea what I was doing. Um, wow. And then yeah. that's that's what I did. So I that's when I went to college in Ohio, in Athens. Wow. That's amazing. Sounds like you had a, and, a blast. Yeah, and part of that there was a TV show called Felicity. It was about a girl who lived in the dorms Felicity. and was a was an RA. And I'm like, I want to be Felicity. So then I became a resident assistant at the university. <laughs> <laughs> you and, were, you were um, joking when you were always like, "Ah, oh, I want I want my life to be like a TV show." Okay. Yeah. So I, like I did that. I uh, I should stop watching like horror shows and. Yeah. X Files, so I can like mimic TV shows in my own life. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm like, like that's a good idea. I'll give that a go. So I did that. Um, loved university so much. And I transferred there and I ended up graduating from a high university. So I was there for three years and got my communications degree from o- OU. And during wow. that time, I did internships during the summertime as well. Oh, nice. And it gives you a, a really good reason to be in the States. You get that student visa. Yeah, perfect. Yep. Yeah. I've been I've been through them all. I had a J1 when I was in on camp. I had an F1 when I was a student. Right. Um so and then I did internships. So I did again 
I'm like, okay, well, all the American kids are doing this. I want to work on all the giant shows. So I was emailing, gosh, who was it at the time? I think I emailed the Oprah, was it even email? No, back then it wasn't email. Sorry, it was letters that you had to print out and put a stamp on and post them, right? <laughs> right, right, snail mail, yikes. Yeah, okay. so I email, I uh, mailed, mailed. <laughs> a bunch of, like the late night show with David Letterman. I wow. think Rick, I think Ricky Lake at the time, okay. Oprah show. Yeah. Like all, the basically the biggest top shows because my dream was. Out, it was a mailer campaign. Yeah. I, I want an internship. Yeah, because that's what that's how you got one back in the day. Resume, applying, all these things. Right. And so they were all in New York except for one, which was Miramax. Okay. And and I didn't really, I wasn't interested in LA. And that's the one that I got. So I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to LA. So then I moved to L I did an internship in LA. Um, and lived in an apartment opposite UCLA with other interns at Miramax. So oh, wow. that was my first engagement with Hollywood. That's and a that was beautiful a game. campus. Yeah. So we just, but again, all on the internet happened to send money. A girl in, a girl in Wisconsin, um, I was on the phone to me one day, ring, ring, like no one had a mobile phone. Hi, I'm going to Miramax to intern. Do you want to live with me? Okay, great. Let's get an apartment. Okay, great. Found two, found two other people to do it. One from Harvard, one from Northwestern. Yeah. Um, got an apartment, send money to who knows where. Right. And then like showed up in LA to, I don't know if you know how long Sunset Boulevard is. Uh, it's, it's long. It's long, yeah. Like who knows where we were even living. It's just luck that it was in a reasonable spot and there was a place to go to when we got there. Wow. Yeah. Um, and then, you could yeah, have so easily an in- been ripped off. Yes, I get oh, it. Oh my gosh. Unbelievable. <laughs> I mean, so, the fact that the address existed and wasn't yeah. just like some warehouse with a, a number oh, on it. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But it was an amazing apartment oh, literally wow. across the road from UCLA. Wow. Um, nice. And so I did a summer in LA interning for Miramax and then I picked up a second internship and that was interviewing Hollywood celebrities on the red carpet. Oh, wow. Holy cow. That's fun. Yeah, super fun. So that was my entree into Hollywood and the film and the industry. That was the turning point. That's when you got your toe in, as they say. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I kept doing university and the next year because you hear things and you're like, okay, well, that must be right. I'll do that. And someone said, okay, so what you need to do is you need to – do an internship, but not with the same company at the same place. I'm right. Like, right. You need more so stuff like, on your resume, basically. Yeah. yeah. So I'm like, okay, great. And they said, but if you stay with the same company and go to a different location, that's good. I'm like, done. So then I did an internship with Miramax in London. So I just wow, that's got a, amazing. Got a, got a plane London's ticket. Even more expensive than LA. Ugh. Yep. So <laughs> got myself. You need got myself to. <laughs> yeah. So I did a summer in London working for Miramax and that was amazing as well. I can imagine. Um, wow, that's fun. Where, what then, part of London? Like uh, right downtown? Ox- Oxford Circus. Oh my goodness. Now I have to think about Oxford Circus. So the perspective of this is pretty amazing considering Harvey Weinstein. Right. But that situation was different at the time. So, you know, he was in London. He's So it was completely different. So, um, met Harvey and really, yeah, well, I mean, okay. he comes in, you've got more. Yeah. So then, um, of ended course. up graduating in 2003 Okay. and moved to LA. Couldn't get a job. Couldn't get a job in LA. Couldn't no, get a job so, in London. Um, well I moved to LA because Hollywood and I wanted okay. to be an agent. Okay. A talent agent. Right. Um, but the struggle I came up against was I had, it was called OPT, Optional Practical Training, which is the visa you get after you're a student. And okay. it was only for a year and no one would hire me because you can, they're like, you well, we can't train you. We can't continue year. on. We're not going to sponsor you. Right. So I was at agencies like ICM at the desk going, but it's international creative management. I'm international. And they're like, <laughs> no. So I ended up working Here's the kicker. I ended up working at Hollywood Video. Oh, nice. In Hollywood, working at a video store. No, not nice. I'm like, I'm literally putting DVDs on a shelf and charging Tory spelling <laughs> no, <not nice>. late <laughs> fees. Not nice. Not I hated nice. it. Yeah. Like, I, 
I had no money. I had to live off a barbecue chicken for a week once and wow. magic noodles that somebody had left with barbecue sauce. And Ew. I had to like walk from A to B yeah, just to right. get around in the middle of the night. Like it was horrible. But again, like I do believe in character building. Yes. So, and then you've got to appreciate where you came from. So yeah. So Tori, all these celebrities would come in and I would just be disgruntled video person so I would like make them pay their late fees so how, how horrible <laughs> so like so I've got all these celebs like Tori Speller you know they were endless because it's their local video store right um and then I went forget this and then so yeah I went to London after that and then I ended up just pretty quickly working for Miramax full time wow so, so um yeah so that's sort of that's it's, the, that's a that's lot the of the early early Kelly story that's amazing yeah. though I mean you went through yeah. it right there. I mean, yeah. a whole lot of amazing like gigs, right? Your yeah. internships were all so, sound like not just fun character building things, but like, you know, really good for the resume and all that stuff. But then uh, Oh no, you learn you learn it from the inside, that's for sure. Oh yeah. So what it, what it, what was it who were the celebrity sort of like class when you were doing the red carpet stuff? What names oh. would I remember? Um John Travolta, okay. Joaquin Phoenix, okay. um, Chris Hemsworth a little bit later uh-huh. on, right. Sarah Michelle Gellar, sure. Buffy. Katie Holmes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You mean the movies that were out at the time? Yeah. Like <laughs> Justin Justin Long before he was famous. I don't even know. Um, <laughs> the, the Captain America guy before he was famous, Kim okay. Basinger, okay. Um, Kirsten Dunst. Yeah. Wow. So there was a bunch of That's stuff. That's all A-lister mostly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so interviewing celebrities is a good skill to have, right. um, especially when it comes to moving into the podcasting business. So all this transfers to that, right? So you've sure. worked at the agencies, you've worked in film studios, you've worked the red carpets, even working at the video store, you have the back catalog of all that. So you learn the interviewing, you learn at the agencies, the negotiation elements. So there's like, it's all building and unparalleled. Yeah. And, um, and, you, and you read all the contracts working in business and legal wow. for the film company and you see how the Oscar campaigns get put together. You see how the publicity gets put together. Right. You uh, work in development and understand the deals. You you get to hear calls. Like it's, there is, yeah, it's unparalleled in entertainment, learning all this from the inside, I would say. No, for sure. You know, I had no idea how much, how much of the, the movies are f- how they are funded. So I, I had, you know, no clue. Right. And then I had a job in, uh, in Los Angeles and it, it was called uh, DBS bank. And it's basically the government bank of Singapore mm-hmm. and they didn't have a branch. They just had a, they call it like a bank office with a bunch of um, people that would go out and talk to producers and movie production, I guess, companies and uh, basically try to uh, invest in movies, movie projects. You know, okay, we've got, you know, $300 million. We want to be working with you, you know. Um, It was just fascinating. I had no idea where the money came from. (laughs) It's not just them, but, you know, okay, banks. That's who's making the money back. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, and the percentage of investment. So I know someone that's invested in the Alanis Morissette musical, and that's a 2.5% investment. And he's run me through how it works. It's pretty amazing, the money side. It is. It's it's just amazing. It's like, and nobody cares about the the content of the movie. <laughs> no, oh, no, no, no. That's a money play. Uh-uh. It's all about track record, right? This guy... All of his movies make money. We don't care what they're about. <laughs> no. no, nobody cares what they're about. Um, you know, obviously they they need to they just need to make money. So that's why there's always like these. I don't know what you'd call them, but they're like. I guess they're relatively cheap, and they're going for that mass market kind of appeal. Um, they'll you'll never not see those. Right. Because even if they're completely inane and kind of bad, they'll always make money. Does that make sense? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Well, that's yeah. why everything is so much towards the franchise model because it's a right. proven, it's, it's a proven. proven to make and that's money. why they'll, yeah. they'll, if they'll get one, they'll do three because they're, 
if you get one hit, you might as well do three. Right. Yeah. So movies now come in trios at minimum. Minimum. And then you have. And then you really want the franchise sort of situation like the Marvels and the Star Wars y. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yes. Crazy. (laughs) But yeah, once you understand that it's just about the money, then then the creative back, well, you know, all everything else makes sense. It's like, okay, is this, is it, why is this movie shitty? <laughs> it's, it's the business of it's, show is right. what they say. The business of show. Interesting. I like that. Yeah. All right. So, um, what is, um, how did you get involved in podcasting? Cause that's, that's gotta be an interesting turn. Yeah, so there's a few more stops and I'll just sure, express route through those. No, no, so no, no, I ran, you know, we're good. <laughs> I, I ran out of my visa in the UK and then I decided to be a tour guide. So I was a tour guide in Europe for a year for a company called Boss About. So I think I did something like over 50 cities, over 14 countries. Wow. And that was just, um, over, again, I saw I was a, a passenger on a coach for. When, when I did the London thing and thought, I can do this. I won't get in. I'll apply. Seems to be a running theme. Applied, got in. Oh, I guess I'm a tour guide now. So I <laughs> did that for a year. So I got to travel around Europe, which is pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, that's going to be And fun. then went back to the States, did some more movie premieres, came back to Australia. And that's when I started working for a talent agency. So because couldn't get in in the US, got in in Australia. So I started. So that was pretty interesting seeing the actors' contracts pitching actors and that was for commercial that was for tv that was for film so i got my um chops working in the talent agency so that okay. was pretty great um and then from that so I, that, that, that would be kind of like you're uh you're an agent so you're representing talent or or what do you what? yeah it was like a junior agent commercial agent it's much smaller like it's certainly no uta CAA, any of those. It was right. a boutique agency. Right. But yeah, so we had a roster of about a hundred actors. Okay. So we would um work with them, send them, send them out. Send them out for, to work. Okay. Yeah. So you send them out for auditions and uh-huh. then so you submit for auditions, book auditions, and then yeah, it's a whole process. It's right. basic think of it like an employment agency, but you have to audition to get the job instead of interviewing. So, so then but the you get actors to, paying the company. No, so it's a the actors work on a uh, agency talent agencies work on a commission basis. So oh. across the board, it would be a ten percent commission basis. So an agent reps um, clients, and then if they book, the agent will negotiate the contract and then gets a ten percent fee of whatever the contract is. Oh, so that's gotcha. how agencies. That's how that's that, how the agent agency gets paid. Okay. Yeah. So agents are different for from managers. So right. there's multiple things, and that a manager is responsible for managing the person's career. So they will take often fifteen percent, maybe twenty percent. Wow. And those are on deals outside of the acting gig. So yeah, there's a whole management actor system. Yeah. That is worked within. So that was great experience too. And then um, I ended up wanting to do something on the side. It was good, but it wasn't creative. So I started working in community radio. I say working, that's not true. I did a course in community radio and from that did some improv on the side and thought I'm pretty good at this radio thing. I like it. I'm going to apply to the national radio school that takes 10 people a year. We'll see if I get in. Probably won't. I might do that for three years and maybe I have a chance. Again, got in. Don't know how. (laughs) Which again, it's the running theme. Yeah, so, you, you're you're get you're getting uh, good at these long shot kind of like. Let's try. Let's see what happens. Yeah. Let's, so let's throw something out there and see what sticks. So and I thought, <laughs> okay, well you. now I'm going to radio school because they only take ten people a year, and I so have that's to. Pretty prestigious now. Yeah, it's the National Radio School. It's the Australian yeah. Film Television and Radio School. Okay. Um, so I did that for it's a concentrated course, like Monday to Friday, basically nine to five. Um, and it's a, that's like a job. What, yeah, it's a graduate diploma in commercial radio broadcasting. So you learn every element from writing commercials to voiceovers to editing wow. to yeah. producing to on air to promotions to. It's the whole business. Right. So I, I did that and then got my first radio job as a radio announcer. Oh, nice. So I did that full time. So this brings us to what year is that? Um, 2008. Right. Um, so I had that and that was a – and the, the hard thing about that is – And this is all in you know, Australia now. 
Yeah, this yeah. is in Sydney. So Sydney. it's the best school in Australia. The equipment is amazing, brand new, commercial grade, like something you'd see at Kiss FM in New, like excellent. Right. And, and then you have a rude awakening of, and now you have to go to a country station where there's literally a chicken outside the studio. <laughs> So that was in Toowoomba. Okay. Wow. So again, it's the gut feeling moment. I knew it was wrong. I knew I didn't want to do it. But your I life didn't is want still to... a TV show still. So this is the fish out oh. of the water, uh, big city yeah. girl in, in, you know, chickens out there. It's very much like Northern Exposure where the doctor has to go to. Yes. Austral- I love uh, that show. Alaska. <laughs> um, so then I was, but, uh, but at least I was, I went from community radio to national radio school to radio announce on air. So right. I felt like that was legit. Right. Right. So I did that and then went, Oh my God, this sucks. I hate this. I'm <laughs> going back to, I need to get out of here. And so I went back to Europe and did a year as a tour guide. Okay. Again. Wow. And then came back to Australia and then got another radio job pretty quickly. And that was a syndicated radio show in Newcastle, which happened to be my hometown. And wow, I did three. So that means it's nationwide, probably. Yeah, went to 22 stations in wow. regional. So it wasn't the Cap Cities, it was regional. And I did the Love Song Dedication show. So oh, that was great. Right. So that was in, so that was at nighttime. I mean, we did all music, you do all the shifts, but primarily it was that. So that is, and I did a, um, a show called The A List. So at that time I was doing six hours a day live on air across the local station and the syndicated station. So that's really where I learned all the radio things in action. So that was pretty amazing. That's a pretty tough shift. Six hours on air? Yeah. Wow. That's a lot. Um, yeah. So that was... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, well I, I, I'm, I'm, pr- I'm pretty I mean, sure it's probably even illegal. But um, <laughs> so... <laughs> I know so, I, Howard Sturden complains about being on air for four hours. Yeah, no four end. hours is the standard in yeah. radio, but because yeah. it was um, across the network station, so you'd literally have to take your shoes off and run down the hall because you were timing out to two different stations. Wow. So there was there was a lot that was learned in that time, like taking the station off air, putting calls across the air over songs, like every mistake you could make, I made it. Right. But there's a lot of lessons in that because when I was learning radio, I would feel sick before I went on air. And then I got to the point where, okay, the universe is falling down around me and there's nothing I can do and I would feel nothing in my stomach. I'd be like, okay, well, what can we do here? What's the solution? So because especially when it's live, there's it's happening in the moment and then it's gone. So that was pretty, that was pretty good lessons, I think. Um, and then I moved to the States. So that brings me to podcasting. So it's a very long, and talking about vroom, vroom, veer. <laughs> You've had a lot a of lot. vrooming and veering a lot. Yeah. So yeah. I realized that it's a long story, but it That's just okay. is showing it takes you a long time to get where you It takes a long time and a lot of steps to build up all the things to get well, you and, where you are. And every little you know, every little vroom, every little veer, you're adding to your resume, but you're also building your character and you're learning lessons and you're learning, you know, like, Hey, this sounds fun. Uh, and then it's not, <laughs> but yeah. you don't know until you do it. Really. You'll it's never Brussels know. sprouts and chocolate. That's the way I look at life. <laughs> and you don't like, know which one's which, but you no, always want to try the a, new thing. Sometimes it's a bloody chocolate covered brussels sprout and until you bite into it you don't realize it jeff sometimes um, it's cold weather in new york <laughs> <laughs> that's just i know it's one of the best cities in the world that's just me being a baby um yeah so moved to la i finally got the a big visa which was great because i'd had a show that was had ratings so i could get that it's called an o1 which is you're gonna love this Alien of Extraordinary Ability. Yes. That's my official when, title. When you're like seven foot tall with big boobs, you get one of those. Yeah. yeah. Alien of Extraordinary Ability in Entertainment <laughs> and Arts. I and love Alien me. of Extraordinary Ability mm-hmm. because Actually, really it's visa made for, category. It's made for actual extraterrestrials. Yeah. Right. But they'll give it to other people too. Yeah, true. Yes. Uh, mo- moved to LA <laughs> and could not get a job in radio. I'm like syndicated radio host. Couldn't, could not get into radio and that's how I got into podcasting. 
Interesting. So, and that was. Did you ever in, try to do any sort of voiceover work? Because you know you sound great. Um. Or, no voiceover. No, not, there's not a your whole. Prof- cup of tea? There's well, I did it for the radio station, but right. that is a whole profession unto itself. It is, and it's I'm not acting, at the. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not at the level to do acting. like they are amazing, right? They are, so, and and it's a tough job. It's a lot harder yeah. than people think. You know, like people that just like to talk think, oh, I can do that. I yeah. talk all the time, and then you realize how much work it is. Yeah, I do not have yeah. the skill. The, right. I'm not. No, right. just because you can run a five k <laughs> doesn't mean you're Olympiad, <laughs> and like that is not. I I know what goes into it, and I'm nowhere near that level. Right. Yes. Um, okay. So. So, yeah. So, I mean, I had podcasted. I did in 2007 when I was in community radio when I was starting out. Yeah. And that that was you would take the show off the logger, take out the music, take out the commercials, and right. that would be a podcast. Oh, so, wow. I had been familiar with it and we'd done it at radio school and along the way. So, I'd been in podcasting since 2007. Right. Um, and this is now 2013. Couldn't get a radio job. Um, and I was, um, ended up starting to write show notes for a company and then started booking for a company. And that was, and then I ended up in podcasting full time. I also had a a side gig as a plus size blogger. Um, and I was doing that as well. So I had a, a, a blog, um, and your blog made money too. Yeah, so I was making money off that. It was called Big Curvy Love. Okay. Um, I used to be 335 pounds and now I'm about at 130. So wow. I'm not a plus size blogger anymore. So that's a whole <laughs> nother story of room that can, room veering. That can be that can be Kelly Glover uh part due. We'll we'll do yeah, that. Yeah, that's that's a whole different yeah, episode. That's, that's another episode. Right. Okay. Um congratulations. And <laughs> thanks. So yeah, so I had my own podcast, my own blog, but that was a side a side thing. Um, and yeah, so that's when I was working in podcasting. I would say to, it's, I can't even think 2013, 2014. Yeah. Um, and then, so I was doing that. That was really amazing. I was booking about 80 podcast interviews a month, wow. which is high volume. Yeah, and I went, I'm pretty good at this. And but having been a radio announcer, radio producer and all the other things, you can see how it sort of played in. Right. Um, and then I decided to get weight loss surgery. So okay, gotcha. I flew back to Australia because I'm not American, American healthcare system. I didn't know what would happen. So mm. I'd lived in Hollywood from 2013. So, and then I got the weight loss surgery in 2017. Mm. So I gave up my Hollywood apartment um, and I came back to Australia and I also got a job as a podcast producer at that point okay. for the world's biggest women's network. Wow. So I produced eight shows for them and two of them were branded podcasts and nice. some, one of them was an award-winning podcast. So that's where the producing element comes from. That's so amazing. that was, um, wow. you know, they were number one ranked shows, 12 episodes, millions of downloads. So that yeah. was a really good experience as well. Right, right. Um, and then after that, I opened up the agency. So the agency is a culmination of- This is the talentsquad.com now, right? The talent squad. Right. So that is the culmination of- All of that 18 Everything, year, right? Yeah. <laughs> but it really is. Yeah, I know. But you've got yeah. like all of the background, you know? You, you're not yeah. just- uh, not just like a podcast, calling you a podcast booker would be like, you know, that's, that's just not enough. <laughs> right. yeah, yeah. So it's kind of everything because right. it's the positioning, it's the PR, it's the agenting, it's the managing, it's right. the, yeah, wow. it's the, bro- there's a lot in there. So, um, but yeah, but it's also kind of, well, real, yeah, it's really a talent booker crossed with a publicist and PR agent. That That's what it is. But there's no... It's hard to explain to people well, what goes it. into it. <laughs> yeah. I get it. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think uh, you uh, actually booked some people on my show. I uh, have for many years. Yeah. Many, many right. years. Yeah. yeah. So I only just realized that this morning when I was Google, uh, I was like searching your name in my Gmail. And I was like, ah. oh, that Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like uh, there's there's a lot of people like there's a lot of podcast bookers emailing me a lot from various podcast booker types companies, right? So, you know, 
you are one of many. But, you know, I remembered, you know, it, this was like, actually, uh, I was like, wait a minute, that, that person was on my show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there's Kelly. Okay. All right. Finally, I, finally. I figured it out. Yeah. So, yeah. Sorry about that. Uh, it, I didn't, I didn't pick it up when I booked you on the oh. show. I did That's not. fine. No, but with you, I know uh, Vroom Vroom V, immediately I know. Jet Smith, like my mind is a Rolodex of thousands of, of shows. podcasts. So yes. you might not know who I am, but I certainly know who you are. Oh, wow. And I've, I've, I must have at least had six or more clients on your show across previous agencies and the current agency because I had a look and there's someone from at least 2014. So we're looking five years back now. You, uh, I don't know how many, but a lot. Yeah, a lot. A lot. Uh, uh, yeah. So good for you. And thanks. <laughs> yeah. Good for you. You're welcome. <laughs> so this has been a blast, but I mean, uh, it's time to wrap up as they say. So let's talk a little bit about how folks can best get in touch with Kelly Glover there at the talent squad. Sure. So just the talent squad.com and the power of podcasting, which I love like radio is I like to play this game of guess what I look like. What do you think I look like? Have a yeah. picture in your brain yeah. and then go to the website and see the picture of me and see if it was right. It's just a fun <laughs> little game. But also check out the talent squad while you're there. And then, um, yeah, if you want to get booked on podcasts or are interested, there's lots of blog posts that you can read along the way. So I promised you I would mention this, uh, this guy that I know from Australia. So he's, uh, he became a famous person now. Um, but when I, uh, his name is Stephen Baxter and now he's on the Australian version of Shark Tank, right? And you said you knew him and you were familiar anyway. So the story goes way back when, and I want to say it was like around 2004-ish, maybe wow. 2005, right? How will po- yeah. So there was this podcast, uh, it was called uh, Winging It. Um, and it was produced in Phoenix, Arizona, and I still know the the guy that that made the show. Um, so this was the very, very super early days of podcasting, right? I can't even believe podcasts were invented then. I that know. sounds so early. I know, I know. So this was like the podcast podcasting version one, right? Really, um, it was a lot different than it is now. But anyway, so. Uh, Stephen Baxter called into the show because it was kind of like a, a, a lot of audience participation, sending in clips and calling into the show and things like that. And he called into the show and he didn't want people to know he was a millionaire. And he, he announced himself as anonymous, right? This is anonymous from Australia. Um, as in, I don't want to tell you what my name is. <laughs> and As in like, basically imagine Mark Cuban calling in. That's the equivalent. Right, right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So he says anonymous. Right. And the show host mishears it because of his Australian accent and thought he said enormous. Oh, <laughs> right. So and then and then at that time, Steve was, you know, kind of big. So he was like, mm, OK, let's go with that. <laughs> yeah. So he was always just enormous. And we knew his name was Steve, but we didn't know what he did in Australia. But he would come. And eventually there was parties and pool parties and we got to hang out and, and I met Steve and I had been, you know, drinking beer and, and swimming at the pool party with Steve for many years. And then in 2014, I had this podcast, actually it might've been a podcast before this podcast. And I think I learned that he was an entrepreneur and very successful. And, and I was like, at that time I was very interested in talking to entrepreneurs. So I was like, Hey, how about it? And he said, yes. So anyway, I thought that was, it's kind of neat. <laughs> um, Jeff, you were literally swimming with sharks. I Welcome was. Welcome to Australia. <laughs> you can tell people that now. I've swum with a shark. I've swum with a shark. Yeah. And, Fact. and, and, he... and you wouldn't be incorrect. <laughs> I'd put that on your resume. I Stick should. that in your pipe and smoke it. There you go. And he's a great guy. <laughs> you should ask him back on the show as if the booker and agent in me says you need to leverage that relationship and get him back on the show. I do. Pull, 
I and do. the producer in me says, pull the audio from 2004 and embed it in the show I, and get well, him to I, tell I've the already, story. Uh, yeah, that would be fun. And it, and the, the audio on that on that rerun is horrible. So I definitely yeah, but that's re- great. I need to that's, redo that that's show. That's perfect. <laughs> no, no, no. Because then you're showing the comparison between 2004 and now, which that's is 15 true. years, oh, by the way. Yeah. And then also, I yeah, no, that's that's not that's that's not a problem. That's a gift. Uh, right. I would listen to that. <laughs> I would listen to that. Yeah, it would. That would be a lot of work editing, but it would be fun to listen to. Okay, it? challenge accepted. <laughs> in me giving in me giving you a challenge, so I am throwing down the gauntlet, Jeff Uh-oh. Smith. Now I have to do you it. Need, you need to book him, otherwise I will. But you have the better relationship, so I go with you. <laughs> uh, book him on the show. Yeah, and do a fifteen-year anniversary episode. That's your goal. Okay, I'll have to do that. All right. Great challenge. And I've accepted. done it. And I've done it on air. Yeah. So, so now, it's public now. You got to do it. Well, Hashtag, no, pres- Hashtag, <laughs> Hashtag no, no pressure. pressure. Hashtag no pressure. Make I can it happen. <laughs> it's not on the air until I publish. So. Hashtag I'll be listening. <laughs> <laughs> also, social media. And how do you know I'm not doing a double ender where I have uh, the audio? You, you don't know that. You don't know. You don't know. You. I do know. You probably are. I, I know you. Anyway, okay, this has been a blast and uh, a challenge accepted. Let's do that. Uh, thank you so much for being on the show and you have an awesome day. Thank you, Jeff. It's been a pleasure. And just congratulations on the 15 years of podcasting and then so many years on this show as well. So it's I know that it's not easy and I know all the interviews that you've done. So shout out to you for doing such a good job. Thanks. You have a good one. Thanks for taking the time to ride along with us on another episode of Vroom Vroom Veer. For podcast info and show notes, be sure to head over to vvveer.com. That's triple V double E R.com. Man, that's fun to say. And we'll catch up with you next time here on Vroom Vroom Veer. Vroom Vroom Veer.